There's not much to do in Antarctica except scientific work. You could check out the wildlife, like some cute penguins and seals. And you'd get to see the occasional whale swimming around. Antarctica is one of the biggest lands out there that's only inhabited by scientists and researchers from all over the world. These scientists dug a hole through some pretty thick ice to study the ancient air and how the atmosphere cleans itself. They used a special drill and dug a clean cylindrical hole 450 feet below the surface. Some of this ice can be up to 800,000 years old and is a good indicator of what the climate was like in the past. It's like checking out tree rings to determine how old a certain tree is, except it's more complicated than that. After the effortless digging, they decided to drop some ice to the bottom of the hole to see what would happen next. They heard some really unusual sounds. It felt like being on a spaceship traveling through a bunch of obstacles with many rocks smashing into each other. The pitches changed over the quick descent of the block of ice, ranging from high pitch and ending with a low heartbeat-like sound. The scientists were puzzled when they first heard this and dropped some more ice, only to find out that the same type of sounds were being produced, just in different variations. They couldn't tell what was down there and, more importantly, why these kinds of sounds were produced. Antarctica boasts quite a few volcanoes, many of which are under super thick sheets of ice. Scientists discovered 91 volcanoes and claimed there could be more, potentially making it the most extensive volcanic region in the world. While they were doing regular scientific research, they came across many unmistakable large cone-shaped figures underground. Some were as deep as two miles in the ice. Some of the peaks were over 3,000 feet tall and dozens of miles across. But on the surface, it's as plain as a sheet of paper. They may have dropped that block of ice inside an actual volcano that they were standing on, but it's unlikely. Even though the underground volcano presence was discovered by accident, there's a small chance they were actually standing on one where they had their workstation set up. It's more likely that they worked in an area where studying ancient climates is easier and less dangerous than other places. They collect ice samples and study them in a lab. It's like discovering a prehistoric insect embedded in amber millions of years ago when dinosaurs used to roam the land. But instead of little bugs, scientists study ancient dust, air bubbles, sea salts, volcanic ash, and anything else that may have come from the environment they can practically tell how the climate was during that time. These ice samples might show that Antarctica's western ice sheet melted when the Earth's climate warmed up. If it did, then it's likely to happen again. That would mean sea levels rising, affecting coastal cities and small remote islands. But scientists aren't sure it's true, despite some evidence to back it up. The process of studying ice samples can take a week or even a year, depending on what they find. They crush or melt the sample bit by bit. And like those tree rings, the deeper the layer, the further we go back in time. In order to study ancient bubbles trapped in ice, researchers have to crush the samples under a vacuum hood to keep the air out while extracting the air and putting it in vials. There are various instruments and devices to study the ice samples. But because it's so sensitive to damage, each measurement must be in a clean room setting so that nothing gets compromised. The scientists have to wear proper body suits and many layers of gloves and constantly get ventilated. Even something as tiny and insignificant as a fingerprint can ruin a sample. They look for certain patterns to see changes in the atmosphere's composition and temperature. But dropping a few blocks of ice down a hole wouldn't be so bad. The reason why it made such a peculiar sound is the same reason why a moving car sounds different when it's honking than when it's stationary. The scientific word for it is the Doppler effect. It's an obvious change in the frequency of a wave with respect to an observer who is moving relative to the wave source. The effect doesn't mean the frequency of the sound changes, it just shifts. And this can be said about other types of waves, like water and light. But sound waves are the most popular ones when it comes to the Doppler effect. So, when the scientists dropped the ice block down the bottom of the hole, the sound waves traveled back up and bounced around the narrow tube where they drilled. That's why they got the pew pew sound. Let's not forget that this ice block traveled 450 feet beneath us. 
Oil ships dig holes in the oceanic crust that go thousands of feet beneath the Earth. The Kola Super Deep Borehole in Russia is the deepest hole ever made by humans. It goes more than 40,000 feet below the surface and took almost 20 years to reach 7.5 miles. Below it is only half the distance to the mantle. In terms of the whole Earth, this very deep hole is literally scratching the surface. This wasn't a hole to dig for oil and wasn't in the ocean either. The drilling was stopped in 1992 when the engineers found out that the temperatures were 100 degrees Fahrenheit higher than they predicted. And then it was abandoned, and it's just been a barren hole now. But that's the closest we've dug to the center of the planet. The scary thing is that some of the workers on the site could hear voices coming from within. All the way in Yemen, an ancient hole exists in Barhut, in the east of the country in the middle of the desert. It's actually closer to Oman than to the capital Sana'a. This hole has puzzled experts and locals. Unlike the holes in Russia and Antarctica, this wasn't man-made. Or was it? It's been around for many years, and the locals try to steer away from it. They don't even like talking about it, since they claim it brings bad luck to those around it or to whoever utters its name. They claim it was created as a prison for spirits, but many rule that out. The hole is 98 feet wide and somewhere between 330 to 650 feet deep. You can also hear strange sounds coming from the inside. But according to some scientists, the well has little to no ventilation and barely has any oxygen down there. So it's unlikely that anyone or anything lives down there. The Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench caught some low-pitched grumble sounds in March of 2016. Some of these grumbles were followed by screeches. They caught these sounds in a span of weeks, using a titanium-encased microphone so that the immense pressure of the lowest point on Earth wouldn't crush it. They had to lower it slowly as well, since it's 1,000 times the atmospheric pressure at sea level. For 23 whole days, the microphone recorded typical sounds of whales passing by and boats sailing across from above, and even rumbles of nearby earthquakes. But they still couldn't determine what caused those initial sounds. The researchers couldn't understand if the noise from the bottom of the Mariana Trench was caused by humans or was natural. They also wanted to know if these sounds affected marine life, like dolphins and whales that rely on echolocation. They still can't figure it out. But scientists estimate that the ocean is about 10 times noisier than it was 50 years ago. With technological developments in shipping, submarines, and underwater construction, the ocean will only get louder with time. Northern lights come with sounds, which nobody talks about. They're usually audible when the auroras are at their most powerful presence. Scientists were always puzzled as to what caused the faint popping and crackling even though they were very far above us. They used some special microphones and found out that the sounds came just 230 feet above us, which is pretty low. They're caused by electrical charges gaining power in a specific region of the auroras. The electrical charges are disturbed by magnetic storms that fire up the northern lights. As a result, some tiny sparks are released into the atmosphere, causing the faint crackling and popping noise. Do you know that NASA explores not only stars, planets, galaxies, or black holes? Hard to believe, but yes. The agency also works on discoveries here on our home planet Earth. So what has NASA recently discovered? Is there life under the ice? While they were analyzing data recently, they discovered something unbelievable hiding under Antarctica's ice. And this discovery not only changes everything we know about the whole water system of the Earth, but it may also help with research about life in space. Humankind's existence might depend on understanding Antarctica and its secrets. So, the recent discoveries reveal vital information about our survival. But before we continue, let's see how much you know about this place, where it's only ice as far as your eyes can see. Antarctica is one of the world's seven continents in the Southern Hemisphere. It's the fifth largest continent in terms of total area, and that means it's almost twice the size of Australia. Want to see real meteorites? Go to Antarctica. Due to its dry climate, Antarctica is one of the best places to observe space. 
But what's even greater is that you can find meteorites on the white surface of the continent. Scientists have already plucked about 45,000 meteorites from the ice, and they think they can see another 300,000. Since there aren't many terrestrial rocks there, it's easy for them to spot them thanks to their dark color. Antarctica's dry desert environment also helps preserve them, even the ones that fell to Earth more than one million years ago. And can you imagine any volcanic activity in Antarctica? It's hard. But this place is where fire meets the ice. West Antarctica is where most volcanic activity occurs. Scientists recently found that 138 volcanoes exist in West Antarctica alone. Wow! You would think that Antarctica is always cold, but no. Its coastal regions can get as warm as 50 degrees Fahrenheit. But have you ever wondered what Antarctica would look like if there were no ice? It may seem unimaginable now, but it was not always covered by ice. That was 34 million years ago, though. So nobody could tell how the continent's surface would be without the ice. But NASA changed that. They generated computer simulations and created the most accurate map of it as of today. What they saw was incredible. The continent was not flat at all like it seemed. It's pretty bumpy with valleys, rolling plains, and high mountains. But this was nothing next to what they had discovered under Antarctica's ice. So what is it? Drum roll, please. NASA found two new subglacial lakes. And what's even cooler about it is that they spotted these lakes from space. How is that? If your answer is high-tech satellites, then you're right. In 2003, NASA launched a satellite called IceSat. It measured ice sheet mass balance and cloud and aerosol heights. The satellite also helped create the ice-free map of Antarctica. In 2010, the European Space Agency launched the second satellite, Cryosat-2. It was for tracking the changes in the thickness of the ice. Then, in 2018, NASA launched the third one, IceSat-2, a follow-on to the IceSat spacecraft. It measured ice sheet elevation and sea ice thickness. It was NASA's most advanced Earth-observing laser instrument. It delivered the highest precision data. And when that was combined with the data from the other satellites, it was possible to spot these two new lakes near a pair of larger ones. But how is it possible that these lakes exist in the first place? The average thickness of most Antarctica ice is approximately 1.2 miles. However, it can get over 1.8 miles thick in some places, especially during the winter. So you might think that there's nothing under there, but science says otherwise. It's not quite possible to see it with your bare eyes, but the continent's ice is slowly but constantly flowing in different directions under the force of its weight. But scientists could not figure out how water moved for many years. That started to change in 2007, when data gathered from the ice sat provided insight into what hides beneath the surface. They first discovered an entire network of meltwater lakes connected under Antarctica's fast-flowing ice streams, and there were hundreds of them. Scripps Institution of Oceanography glaciologist Helen Amanda Fricker figured that the elevation changes measured by ice sat happened because of the dynamics of these lakes. They did not hold meltwater statically. Instead, they were filling and draining continuously over time through a system of waterways. And as they did that, the ice above rose and fell. But where do they drain? The ocean, of course, and it drains a lot. A recent study, co-authored by Fricker, found that the drainage of one lake flushed as much as 198 billion gallons into the ocean in only three days. Countless mysteries about how nature works are still waiting to be solved. But finding the two new lakes will give scientists a better picture of how fast the Antarctic ice sheet will change as the climate gets warmer and how this will affect global ocean currents and sea level rise. The filling and draining cycle of the lakes also caused the ice sheet to suffer cracks and crevices. So 
The information they find from these new lakes will also give them a better understanding of the damage on the surface of the ice. They will also be able to assess how this filling and draining system influences the speed at which ice slips into the oceans and seas. And that means they can evaluate how the added freshwater may alter marine ecosystems. This discovery may also suggest whether life is under the ice. Wow! Scientists drilled through about 3,504 feet of ice and found that water samples taken from one of the lakes contained approximately 10,000 bacterial cells per milliliter. Such a high number of bacterial life is a good sign because that means the icy waters might also support higher life forms, such as microanimals, and one of these new lakes might even be their home. But the most exciting thing is that the new lakes might help them understand whether life on other planets is possible. Scientists believe any life below the frozen surface of the planet Mars might follow the patterns seen in Antarctica's lakes. So, there is a possibility that they might find critical new information on the type of life that may have existed on the red planet. You wouldn't want to be there during the winter, though. The lowest temperature on Earth you can experience is negative 128 degrees Fahrenheit. In 2010, there was an even lower temperature of negative 135 degrees Fahrenheit. And you may feel this cold much worse due to the strong and dry winds. Did you know that the size of the ice surface on Antarctica also changes throughout the year? It's about 1.2 million square miles during the summer, but when it's winter, it grows to 7.3 million square miles. Yet, despite the change, it remains the largest piece of ice on Earth. Sorry, Arctic, you lose. Do you know these cute little penguins? Consider these animals the locals, because there is no native population in Antarctica. It's a no-man's land, because no single country owns it. But do you know who really owns it? Five different species of penguins, seals, and killer whales. Ha ha. Despite the continent's harsh conditions, you can visit it as a tourist for fishing and research purposes. Around 5,000 people reside on the continent during summer at research stations. But when winter comes, the number naturally drops down to 1,000. Antarctica's ice blanket makes up 70% of the world's freshwater reserves. Imagine what would happen if it melted. The global sea levels would be raised by almost 200. Antarctica is the most remote continent on the planet. It has 90% of the world's ice, but it's considered a desert because the annual rainfall is only about 8 inches. You'd probably never think it was a desert if you look at it, since it's white and full of wildlife. But Antarctica is not only what it appears to be on the surface. There is so much hidden beneath it, and even above it. Atlantis has long been a mystery for humankind. Did it ever exist? And if yes, where was it located? One of the theories supports that the Atlantean civilization could have thrived and flourished in the Antarctic continent when it was still uncovered by ice. Due to the Earth's cyclical eras, this is the periods of ice and interglacial periods. It was believed that Antarctica was actually a tropical forest. And, well, a recent Google Earth picture found some interesting ruins buried deep within a lake bed on the icy continent. It's unclear to which civilization these remains belong to, but some theorists believe that it could perfectly be Atlantis. And these frozen Antarctic lakes are holding much more under them. In the 1970s, scientists were surprised to find large lakes under the ice plaques in the frozen continent. Over 400 lake beds are believed to exist under layers of ice. Lake Vostok, for instance, the largest subglacial lake over there, is buried beneath two miles of thick ice. There are pristine blue ice caves hidden under there as well. The water in these lakes remains liquid due to the small levels of geothermal heat from the Earth's core. And some scientists believe that some lakes are around 15 million years old. Talk about the old days, huh? Now, amongst the unique phenomena that occur in the continent, let's say Antarctica is home to an extremely weird waterfall. 
The year was 1911 when Australian geologists wondered about the so-called Blood Falls. He was extremely puzzled by this red stream of liquid pouring from a small hillside amongst the Antarctic ice. After years of studying it, it was understood what caused the redness was the high iron content in the water. The last piece of the puzzle came when scientists discovered that there was an underground lake with water full of oxidized iron nearby, which was what caused the blood fall to exist in the first place. And speaking of puzzles, this image might be quite puzzling. After all, why on earth would anyone need to take cash to Antarctica? Well, a little history first. Back in 1956, the U.S. founded McMurdo Research Station, which is the biggest science hub in the continent to date. At its peak, the McMurdo Station hosts from 200 to 1,000 scientists. And these people need money to buy coffee, pizza, and other things to meet their daily needs. That's when Wells Fargo decided to install an ATM there. Oh, and they even set a Guinness World Record this way. The Wells Fargo ATM at McMurdo Station is the most southern one in the world. And it's the loneliest ATM in the world as well, as there isn't another one for hundreds and hundreds of miles. The freezing temperatures in Antarctica can make the continent hostile to human life. Actually, Antarctica is the coldest, driest, and windiest continent on our planet. The average temperature along the coast is around 14 degrees Fahrenheit. But as you head towards the Antarctic hinterlands, it gets even colder than that. The interior of the continent can register temperatures of around negative 71 degrees Fahrenheit. On the bright side, these freezing conditions can account for some mesmerizing phenomena, such as ice bubbles. These bubbles frozen inside some Antarctic lakes are bubbles of methane gas. The gas released from the melting of glaciers ends up freezing midway and makes for a beautiful and exotic scene. I guess methane never looked this pretty before, did it? A few years ago, scientists were taken aback by a giant hole the size of the Netherlands in one Antarctic lake. For scale, that's more or less the size of Lake Michigan. These holes are called polinias, and they are a natural phenomenon in the continent. However, this one is the biggest scientists have ever seen since the 1970s. So you'll understand, polinias are massive holes in a sea of ice. Most of them occur along the continent's coast, but this new one was found in the Weddell Sea, much farther from the shore. Scientists are still trying to understand how that happened and what its implications are for the climate in the region. There's one feature in the continent that looks completely man-made and has even sparked several theories around the world regarding its origins. I mean, this formation looks exactly like other man-made pyramids, doesn't it? The only difference is that this is actually a natural rock formation and has existed for a very long time. It was first found during an expedition in the 1910s and was kept secret ever since. It was nicknamed Pyramid, but its correct scientific name is Nunatak, which is simply a peak of rock sticking out above a glacier or an ice sheet. There are other famous peaks that look pyramid-shaped, such as the Matterhorn in Switzerland. So no, this really isn't a human construction, we're sure of it. And the list of fascinating discoveries on the ice continent goes on. An artificial intelligence program was analyzing a set of data on Antarctica when it came across a stunning discovery. There may be up to 300,000 undiscovered meteorites to be found in the icy field of the continent. The truth is, meteorites have been falling on the continent for millions of years. But it was only 110 years ago that the first one was found. And guess what? Recently, researchers found a Martian meteorite in East Antarctica. It was the biggest one found in the last 25 years, and it weighed about 165 pounds. Now, usually fire and ice are rather a tricky combination. So I'm guessing you wouldn't say that Antarctica hosts an active volcano, right? But it does. 
The volcano, known as Mount Erebus, is the southernmost active volcano in the world with liquid magma and lava boiling for eons. Actually, Mount Erebus has been active for over a million years, and it's Antarctica's second highest volcano with a height of 12,000 feet. We've mentioned before that Antarctica wasn't always icy, but could you imagine a huge rainforest covering the entire continent? This isn't science fiction, it's actually true. Leaf impressions and fossilized wood clearly show signs of tropical trees in the region. Fossil research has also revealed something magnificent. Antarctica is home to the oldest worm in the world. According to National Geographic, sperm fossils found in Antarctica reveal a long extinct species of worm that is around 50 million years old. Scientists claim that this discovery is beyond important to studying some evolutionary relationships and say that this was only possible due to the freezing of such samples for thousands of years. Antarctica is a continent rich in biodiversity. Penguins, polar bears, and seals are just some of the animals we know that exist down there. But there is also a rare and fascinating species of fish that inhabits Antarctic waters. Popularly known as the see-through fish, this species is as bizarre as it is beautiful. This fish had to adapt to survive the cold water temperature in Antarctica, so much so that it evolved into a unique being. As well as a transparent body, this fish has transparent blood, making it completely see-through. This is because they lack the protein hemoglobin, which gives blood its red color. Pretty neat, huh? When you think of Antarctica, you probably think of icebergs, right? So here are some fun facts about it. Did you know that icebergs have a lifespan of about 3,000 years? And that together with Greenland, Antarctica is one of the world's primary sources of icebergs. Icebergs can reach 600 to 700 feet below the surface of the water, and around 90% of an iceberg is hidden underwater. That's where the expression, tip of the iceberg, comes from. We've all dreamed of visiting the Arctic and witnessing the natural wonders of polar bears frolicking on ice floes, or the aurora borealis dancing across the sky. Well, sorry to break it to you, but you won't find any tourists flocking to Antarctica anytime soon. Why, you may ask? Let's dive into it. First off, where is Antarctica? It's located in the Southern Hemisphere, specifically at the South Pole. The Southern Ocean surrounds it, and most of the continent is covered by ice, making it one of the most remote and frigid places on Earth. Now, have you ever met someone who's visited Antarctica? Probably not. It's one of the least visited places on the planet, and only a handful of lucky explorers have seen its interior which is mostly made up of glaciers and ice fields. But trust me when I say the wildlife and scenery are out of this world. Why shouldn't you travel to Antarctica? Well, for starters, the environment is incredibly fragile and can be easily damaged. Plus, there are no native human populations on the continent. So your travels would essentially be like visiting an uninhabited island. And let's not forget, that it's also one of the most expensive destinations to travel to. Despite all that, Antarctica is not exactly guarded like a fortress, but there is an international agreement called the Antarctic Treaty. This treaty was negotiated to prevent any unwanted activity on the continent and bans some forms of testing done there by member states. But the primary reason we can't just waltz into Antarctica is that it has a delicate ecosystem that needs protection. The treaty states that Antarctica should be used for peaceful purposes only and should be free from any human activity that could harm the environment. Scientists are still learning about the continent's unique ecosystem, and our activity and machines could disrupt the delicate balance that exists there. If you're still itching to go to Antarctica, getting permission isn't exactly a walk in the park. U.S. citizens, for example, need to complete a special form and send it to the Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs. And once you're there, you'll need to follow some strict guidelines to protect the environment, like not disturbing any wildlife or taking souvenirs like rocks, plants, or animals. Now, technically, can you live in Antarctica? 
While there are no laws banning people from living there permanently, it's a very inhospitable environment and unsuitable for human habitation. Temperatures can reach negative 76 degrees Fahrenheit and below, making it nearly impossible for anyone to survive without the proper equipment and experience. Plus, the nearest piece of land is over 1,000 miles away, making any inhabitants completely cut off from the rest of the world. Who knows, maybe one day we'll get the chance to visit this unique and fascinating continent. But until then, let's admire it from afar. Let's now talk a bit about the discovery of Antarctica. Unlike other places that were already inhabited, Antarctica never had a native human population. Ancient Greek philosophers had an idea about the continent and called it Antarktos, meaning opposite the bear. The bears it refers to are not the polar ones though, but rather the great and little bear constellations, which are only observable in the northern hemisphere. As a result, the term signifies the opposite of the land of the bear. Whaling and sealing voyages in the late 1700s and early 1800s would venture further south when rounding Cape Horn at the tip of South America. It was known that going further south often meant stronger winds, but also the risk of hitting floating ice of all sizes and of winds and seas that could prove dangerous to the ship and crew. Captain James Cook was the first to cross the Antarctic Circle on January 17, 1773, in the Ross Sea region. He reached a point further north a year later, and though he didn't sight land, he came to within 50 miles and saw deposits of rock held in icebergs, indicating that a more southerly land existed. The first sighting of Antarctica is widely acknowledged to have taken place in January of 1820 during the voyage of two ships under the command of Captain Fabian Gottlieb von Bellingshausen as part of a two-year exploratory expedition around the world to discover new lands. The captain's ships were the first to have crossed the Antarctic Circle since Cook. The first undisputed landing on Antarctica didn't happen until much later, on January 24, 1895, at Cape Adare during the whaling voyage of the ship Antarctic led by Henrik Bull. A small boat with six or possibly seven men on board rowed ashore during calm conditions. You might not believe it, but Antarctica is actually a desert. With all that ice, you'd think it'd be like a winter wonderland with snowball fights and hot cocoa all day long. When we think of deserts, we picture camels and cacti and people struggling to find water. But in Antarctica, it's a whole different story. The struggle isn't to find water, it's to find anything that's not covered in ice. And the average rainfall has been just over 0.4 inches in the past 30 years. That's like a few drops of rain compared to what we're used to. So technically, it's not the dunes or sizzling heat that makes a desert, well, a desert. It's the lack of precipitation. But don't worry, if you ever find yourself lost in Antarctica, you won't have to worry about getting thirsty. Just make sure you bring a jacket and some mittens because it's cold enough to make you into a popsicle. Not only is Antarctica one of the driest places on Earth, but it's also the coldest, the windiest, and the highest. <laughs> Talk about overachieving. The penguins and scientists down in Antarctica have at times found themselves in a bit of a pickle when it comes to time. You see, unlike the rest of us on this big blue planet, there is no Antarctica time zone. All the lines of longitude meet at a single point at the South Pole, making it a bit of a head-scratcher when trying to figure out what time it is. Now, you might be thinking, but how do the scientists and researchers keep track of time down there? Good question. They typically stick to the time zone of the country they departed from. However, with stations from all over the world on the Antarctic Peninsula, things can get a little wacky. Imagine trying to coordinate with your neighboring countries without accidentally waking them up in the middle of the night. You might think that not much could survive in a place where the temperature is extremely cold, the sun barely shows up, and the wind could blow you away faster than a tumbleweed. Well, as in many places on Earth, life found a way in Antarctica too. Believe it or not, this frozen continent is buzzing with activity. 
It's home to billions of krill, which in turn attract lots of seals and more penguins than you can shake a fish at. But don't let their cute and cuddly appearance fool you. Penguins are the ultimate swimmers, with streamlined bodies that would make Olympic medal winners jealous. They come ashore to breed and chill, but their real talent is stealing pebbles from each other and forming mathematically precise huddles to stay warm. Antarctica is also home to the largest species of penguin on Earth. It's called the emperor penguin. Sure, these creatures are flightless birds, but that doesn't mean they can't jump. In fact, some of them can leap up to 120 inches. And let's not forget about the seals. With their furry bodies and special songs, these marine mammals are protected by the Antarctic Treaty, and they're thriving in the cool waters of the Southern Ocean, too. But the real stars of the show are the whales. During the Antarctic summer, these huge creatures show up in droves to chow down on the abundant krill. It's indeed like a whale buffet down there. It was one of the biggest creatures ever to roam the Earth. It was longer than your average school bus and could easily weigh more than 10 elephants combined. But where did it live? How did it end up having this size? And most importantly, why is it extinct nowadays? Let's find out. The Megalodon was the largest predator ever known in our planet's history. In terms of its location, the Megalodon lived practically in all waters on our globe, except near the poles. The reason why there were no Megalodon teeth found in Antarctica is probably that the gigantic creature adapted to only warm, tropical, and subtropical waters. The younger ones liked to keep to the shores, while full-grown adults preferred coastal areas. But they could easily move into the open ocean as well. How do we know the Megalodon was so widely spread? We can only presume based on the fact that they discovered the most northern fossils off the coast of Denmark and the most southern in New Zealand. The discussion of how the Megalodon got this size is still open in the scientific community. They recently found out that not all the specimens from this fascinating species reach the same huge size. This has to do with a little something called the Bergman's Rule which says that the temperature of the surrounding environment affects the animal's body size because they either need to conserve or shed heat. The megalodons that reach cooler waters probably needed more body weight to make sure they survived in low temperatures. On the contrary, those living in warmer waters had to be smaller to avoid burning up. But what did this enormous fish look like? Most modern depictions show the megalodon resembling an enormous great white shark. But well, it seems it may not necessarily be correct. The megalodon likely had a much shorter nose and a flatter jaw that looked almost squashed when compared with a great white shark. It also seems to have something in common with the modern blue shark – extra-long pectoral fins. They needed these to support their weight and size while navigating the planet's waters. Lastly, the lady megalodons ooh, seem to have been about twice as large as the gentleman. As for their offspring, even a small megalodon was enormous, at least 6.5 feet from nose to tail. How do we know that? Because specialists have stumbled upon megalodon nursery habitats in Panama, Maryland, the Canary Islands, and Florida. Even the piles of used diapers were enormous. Nah, not really. Surely the scariest aspect of the megalodon's looks was its mouth. I mean, think about it. Megalodon had whales for dinner, so it obviously needed to open its mouth wide enough. Scientists have estimated that its jaw would span a mind-boggling size 9 by 11 feet wide. Just to paint you a better picture, that means it could have easily gulped down two adult people side by side. Wait, which two adults? Those impressive jaws also feature 276 teeth. Based on modern reconstructions of the force of its bite, it looks like it may have been one of the most, if not the most, powerful animals of prey ever to exist in. For comparison, humans can have a bite force of around 1,300 newtons. Today, great white sharks have been estimated to be able to bite down with a force of over 18,000 newtons. The megalodon tops all the records, with an estimated power of bite up to 10 times greater than that. It could basically crush a car with very little effort. Its teeth were also pretty amazing. Similar to sharks, the megalodon was fast in replacing its broken or worn teeth. With four or five rows of teeth in its mouth, 
It basically acted like a conveyor belt, growing back damaged or missing teeth within about 48 hours. This means that an adult megalodon probably would have grown several thousand teeth throughout its lifetime. It was nice of them to do that, though, since it's probably one of the reasons why megalodon teeth are so common in fossil records and were able to study them properly. To maintain its impressive physique, the megalodon had to eat somewhere around 2,500 pounds of food per day. Can't wrap your head around that? Well, it was the equivalent of one and a quarter cows per day to survive. It's like if you had to eat 3,300 cans of tuna every day. I've used the word megalodon a lot, but have I mentioned where it comes from? When translated from Greek, it means giant tooth. Ah, those clever Greeks. However, this giant shark's full scientific name is a bit more complicated. Carcharocles megalodon. But are these gigantic predators actually extinct? We tend to believe so, but let's be honest for a second. We've come to know more about the surface of Mars than the depths of our oceans. Like, we've only explored 15% of our oceans altogether. Who knows what may be lying out there in the deep? Maybe some ancient predators? The Mariana Trench is the deepest oceanic trench on Earth. The Challenger Deep, its deepest part, is so deep that you could dip the whole of Mount Everest in there and it would still be over a mile above the surface. That's deep. If a megalodon or two ever needed a place to crash, that would be a discreet enough location. However, the Mariana Trench is not a particularly comfy place to be in. You know, because it's cold and steeped in total darkness and all. The temperatures here are around 36 degrees Fahrenheit all year round. And to top it all off, the pressure is a thousand times stronger than at sea level. So it's safe to assume that if any megalodon is hiding in here, its teeth and bones might not be looking so good. Because of the intense pressure here in the Mariana Trench, proteins and calcium start to dissolve and disintegrate. That's why, for example, the Haddell snailfish, the deepest dwelling fish we've discovered, has evolved to feature flexible cartilage instead of bones. To survive here, the megalodon would also need to learn to navigate in complete darkness. That means they would have to either become luminescent or evolve to grow massive eyes like the giant squid. While it may sound like an intriguing and good idea for a movie script, most scientists don't think it's possible. Why? Well, most of them say it's because of the megalodon's size. Most foods that megalodons like to eat live in shallow ocean areas and not in the deep, deep sea. Specialists believe that if these animals were actually still roaming our waters, there's no way we wouldn't know about it. They would need to come up for dinner every now and then, right? Their food is also the most likely cause of why the megalodon is not alive anymore. While some specialists believe the megalodon became extinct because of a drop in the ocean water temperature, most scientists suggested that the shifting food chain dynamics may have been more to blame. Why? Because, at some point, there was less and less of its primary food source, baleen whales. And at the same time, the numbers of its natural competitors, like smaller predatory sharks like the great white shark and whales, increased. The megalodon did live on this planet a lot more than we did, and way back when we didn't even exist yet. They were here for nearly 70 times longer than we, modern humans, have, inhabiting the oceans for around 20 million years. Homo sapiens appeared around 300,000 years ago. The megalodon managed to survive for so long mostly because of its unbeatable size. I mean, they can make a meal out of almost everything in the sea at the time. We may think about both of them as prehistoric creatures, but the megalodons and the dinosaurs never coexisted on Earth. The dinosaurs probably died out about 66 million years ago. Megalodons seem to have appeared a bit later. That's because the oldest megalodon fossils we have yet discovered are from the Miocene Epoch, which began 23 million years ago. So long, Meg!